Thank you, Peter, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, as I think you'll have seen from Michael's presentation, I have taken my role at Yale to try and get every single part of the university working towards Himalayaka. And to that end, um, I have the pleasure of working with Tripp and, and Peter and many others on a new course. So I'm going to speak just for a few minutes and then pass over to Tripp and talk you through really what we've been doing with a, a new class that we're in the middle of right now. This is quite experimental for us also, so um, if it's a bit basic, then please indulge us. The idea for a course using uh, Yale's collections of Himalayan materials came out of an exhibit that I co-curated here at Yale in the Sterling Library earlier this year with two colleagues, Sarah Calhoun, who is also in the library, responsible for South Asian collections, and a faculty member, Andrew Quintman, in religious studies. Yale has extraordinarily rich and deep and rather understudied collections of Himalayan materials. We thought it would be fun to pull a few of these together in an exhibit and see what conversation came out of it. What came out of it was that we realized we could actually do something much more ambitious with the collection and teach a class. So I've been battling in my two and a half years at Yale with a problem. These wonderful final papers come into my inbox in a class, and I grade them, and they often do very well because the students are fantastic. But what happens with them afterwards? Some, I believe, should have an afterlife. There's something in these papers that is interesting and usable, but they don't have any traction. They end with the class. And of course, students at Yale are accomplished in writing final papers. I mean, they got in because they're wonderful synthesizers of other people's information, right? Wonderful analytical skills, but how can you move beyond it? And my idea in discussion with Tripp and, and many other colleagues was to actually develop a hands-on and truly collaborative class. We could perhaps explore the links between Yale's collections that are drawn from or about the Himalayan region, and as a result, actually do something that would have an afterlife beyond the class, produce crowdsourced richer catalogue descriptions for these collections. I should be clear, we're talking about art in the galleries, um, materials, beautiful, illuminated Tibetan manuscripts in the Beinecke, uh, missionary collections in the Divinity School, and also collections in the Sterling Library of the first ambassador, US ambassador to Nepal. But many of these catalogues, many of these folders, just say 12 letters or 23 photographs. Could we do something with these collections? And at the same time, could we fold back that which we learned, the, the classwork itself, into the online catalog at Yale, make it visible, make it discoverable? Of course, something like this is experimental. It's challenging for students to work with primary materials, often for the first time in their academic careers. It's hard for them to evaluate and triage different sources of information. What is legitimate? What has authority? How do you compare a book with a missionary manuscript with a photograph? And all the time, they're bothered by one thing, which is, Professor, are you saying that people will see this after I've left Yale? In other words, yes, you may actually have a trail that, um, that extends beyond you. Of course, it's possible here because we have these world-class and rather underutilized collections. Because thanks to the ex-president, former president of Yale, Rick, Rick Levin, we have a very generous, open access policy that, that says everything we've got at Yale in cultural heritage should be available to all. We also have funding available through different streams within IT and library services to actually encourage faculty to engage with technology in the classroom. And then we have many of you, archivists, curators, librarians, instructional technologists, who are just excited to collaborate in the pedagogy of a classroom. So far, the students love it, but they find it really challenging. Together, we're actually learning our way around the whole Yale campus, thanks to the wonderful Yale shuttle service, because many undergrads don't really make it up to divinity during their time here, unless they have good cause. And at the same time, we're discovering that we, as a community, of staff, faculty, and students are collaborating about how knowledge is shared, produced, and understood. It's generated lots of interests um, among sort of the Yale undergraduate body, the newspapers. I'm constantly getting emails from people saying, how are you doing this, and why are you doing this? Which I think is also an excellent question. Some of the challenges and surprises we faced um, is that students we have here, while they're very good users of digital content, they're not always great producers of it. Um, it's a different thing to have to build a catalog than to use one. There's also a lot to learn, and I don't think we have enough time. And our core team, well, I'll come on to that in a moment, 
it's a very intense experience for all of us working on this. It, it's much more work than any other class I've ever taught. So one question with that is, is it scalable and is it sustainable? On that note, here we have the core team, myself, Sarah Calhoun, I'd mentioned in the library, Tripp here, Peter Leonard, who we've heard from, of course, and Luke Wagner, a teaching fellow funded by the um, graduate school. There are other two members who are not core, who are not you know, full-time engaged um, with this kind of work. Daniel Ho, a graphic designer in New York, and Chika Ota, a graphic designer here at Yale who does wonderful work and has helped us with our kind of visual look and feel. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Tripp. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and in fact, as I pull this up, I want to thank Mark very much for bringing this project to ITG and for giving me a, a chance to be a part of it. Um, it's very exciting to bring all these people together and, and to do some work. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology and the environment, environment in a couple different senses. Uh, first of all, Mark mentioned the places we've gone to. Uh, this is the art gallery, the Day Mission Library. Uh, manuscripts and archives we're not physically in, so I don't have a picture of them. Uh, and, the, and the Beinke. And all these uh, materials we've been working with at these different places have different levels of digitization that have come along with them. Uh, we're using Omeka for the platform. It comes out of the Center for History and New Media uh, at George Mason University. It's well sustained by them. Uh, it has been called sometimes WordPress for libraries and museums. And that's roughly true, but one of the things that I've found so far is that, um, and this is my third time using it in a roughly year-long uh, casual pilot uh, in a various classes, is that there's not as big a community around it as there is with WordPress. So uh, some things are limited. They've migrated to a new version recently, and so there are some limitations. It also uh, has a certain sort of worldview about what open means. Uh, it has made decisions that it, things are very flat in Omeka. Uh, and so there are other tools out there that have different uh, permissioning systems that I'd, I'd be interested in looking into in the future. Uh, and so I'm going to take you through very quickly um, the uh, sort of one drill into the platform we're using uh, just to uh, get into one student's work and talk about that just a little bit. So this is our uh, home page. Uh, we have this very nice poster that, that Chika Ota designed. Mark was mentioning her. Uh, and these are a list of collections. So it has this model of items, collections, exhibits. Uh, these are some collections that the students have put together. Uh, one of the students whose work has been really nice is Courtney Randolph, who's done some work with Gwen Coventry Letters at the Div School. Um, so she enters this collection, she enters a lot of metadata and makes choices about what goes into this. This is a box that has had some study done to it, uh, but as far as I know, she's not merely replicating the work that's been done. She's doing her own unique work, which is very nice. Um, uh, she has digitized a lot of the items uh, that were not previously digitized in this box from the archives. Uh, and each of these items she's gone in further to digitize. I'll pull one of those up. She's gone through each page of this and photographed it. And uh, uh, no, that's just a screenshot. But these as well have their own metadata for them. So she has put all of this together in an exhibit which looks like this. It looks a little bit different from the main site. Uh, and this is just the front page. And it's just a work in progress. She's done this as part of a mini assignment uh, that this is going to go on to be the first stage of, the, of a final assignment. Um, and I'm really impressed. I've, I've liked very much the work that she's done on this. Um, this is the one screen of the admin side of it. And you can see all the possibilities of use of this. The students are full administrators in this site, so they can go into it basically and do what they want. We have to give them a bit of a talk just to say, don't delete other people's things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ever talk to anybody about Omeka, sooner or later you'll have somebody who said, oh, well, yes, you have to make your students admins, and one of them deleted every other student's stuff. Um, so fortunately, we have not had that yet. They've been very responsible. Um, so uh, lots of people here work with metadata, so to some extent you know what I might be getting to next. But so they, the students have to make their decisions of, of this. Some of it they can recapitulate from other existing sources, um, but some of it they have to come up with their on, the, on their own. And so one of the nice things about it for me is that it, it starts to articulate to the students that there is labor attached to all of this. There's intellectual labor, there's digital labor attached to all of this. Uh, I've tried to foreground uh, a critical technology literacy with them. Uh, I admit it's been a bit shallow so far, but again, as Mark said, it's a bit experimental. We're working this out. Um, 
And so when the students come to this and have to start entering things, and what they see is actually this, um, not this small, uh, but they see screens and screens and screens of metadata and start having to think about these things, uh, they, they pick up on it and, and they realize just how much work, uh, frankly, in a sense, how much work you and we do on this stuff. And they start getting a, a sense of what the bigger picture of, of digital scholarship and curation and, and, uh, and editorial work is. Uh, and it's really remarkable the way the students are picking up on that. <laughs>